This is always a struggle for those leading when an outpouring comes. What do you allow and what do you restrict? And this is difficult. You know, and there are those who are very uncomfortable with anything to do with the Holy Spirit, so they just write the whole thing off and say that this isn't for today. There's no openness to the Spirit moving. Hi, everyone. Thank you again for joining me. I thought in this session that I want to talk about Lonnie Frisbee. And uh, some of you, if you're older, uh, and if you've seen the movie, The Jesus Revolution, you're familiar with that name. Now, personally, uh, because I was a 70s high school student, uh, a lot of what happened in the movie, even listening to some of that music, I mean, that, that was my high school days, and I remember Jesus Freaks at school, so all of that brought back memories. <clears throat> but now, I realize this idea of Lonnie Frisbee, um, I, I have been a student of revival since the early 80s. In fact, in the 90s, I read a book on the history of Calvary Chapel, Chuck Smith, the, the Jesus people, all the stuff that was happening in Southern California, and the name Lonnie Frisbee was not in that book. I, I, I would have remembered that. There was, there was nothing there. I never heard the name Lonnie Frisbee until 2006 while I was having a conversation with somebody. Somebody brought him up, and I'd, I'd never heard it before. I looked him up, and I, there wasn't a lot that I found then. Uh, because, you know, even back then, I wasn't going to YouTube very much. And, and uh, so that, uh, I, I didn't think to get the background on that. But since this movie, YouTube is just full of past documentaries that have been done and uh, interviews, interviews with his brother, interviews with his best friend. So there's just a lot of material. And uh, Lonnie Frisbee was an interesting character, but the movie... In reviewing some of the interviews, even the movie didn't cover a lot of things tied in with him. So I want to talk about him and uh, give you some highlights of his life, just some of the things that I've discovered, and then wrap it up with some thoughts about Lonnie himself and uh, the things that took place, some of the historical things I think that just have been left out. Uh, people were a little nervous. How do we handle this? And then what would happen if God were to move today and you had a brand new believer who had all of this gifting? They had a tremendous gift for the prophetic and for healing, and but they're very immature and they're coming from a crazy background. What do you do with that person? How do you, how do you steward that as a, as a leader? So a lot of this, when I get to the end, I'll be applying things to you that are in leadership. And if a, and if a powerful revival, an outpouring came to you. What do you do with some of these things? So well, we're going to talk about that. So just working our way down through some of the highlights of Lonnie's life. <clears throat> um, he was born in Costa Mesa, California in 1949 and uh, was born into a family that uh, his father and mother divorced when he was very young and his father had an affair and, and decided to marry that woman. So Lonnie's dad divorced, and then the woman divorced. They got married, started their life. Well, the husband that was left from the other marriage, Lonnie's mom found him and married him. And then they had, he already had some kids, and then in a short time, they had kids of their own. So Lonnie had his mom, his dad, and stepmom, and then Lonnie's mom marries, so now he's got a stepdad, and he immediately had step-siblings, and then in a short time he had half-siblings. So this is a family where there's just a lot that's taking place there. Also, I saw a couple hours of interview with his brother Stan. Stan happens to be a minister in a vineyard church now in California. And uh, he, he said that when Stan and Lonnie were born, they had club feet. So they had to wear, early on for several years, they had to wear braces on their feet to straighten, straighten the lower leg out. And uh, that was done successfully. And then those two brothers loved to dance. And maybe they loved to dance be, just because they, they couldn't uh, while they had all those braces on. And they started to enter dance contests. And this is 
late 60s, early 70s dance contests. Well, probably, probably late 60s. And Lonnie ended up being on Casey Kasem's show, uh, Shebang. And he was one of the featured dancers that was on there. Uh, they also were in dance contests around uh, around their general area of L.A., and they won them so often, they the organizers finally told them to stop dancing because they beat everybody, and they asked them to be judges. So they just had a lot of talent in the in in that area. Lonnie's brother Stan was the older brother. He was very athletic. He was a wrestler, and Lonnie was had a very slight frame, and uh, <clears throat> leaned more toward the music and the artistic side. But he always looked up to this brother, so I thought that was interesting. Um, Lonnie, early in life, uh, there was a neighbor boy that his mom looked at as the model child. And so she was always pushing Lonnie toward this older boy to hang out with him and, and maybe some of his, some of his attributes would rub off on him. But she didn't know was for years, this boy was molesting and, uh, in one account said that it had raped Lonnie. So he had, had that molestation, same-sex molestation early in life that would miswire him uh, early on. Um, He received an art scholarship when he was in high school to the San Francisco Art Academy. And uh, so he went went to San Francisco and started living in the Haight-Ashbury area, which really was the hub of hippie life in Northern California. And then he really took on all of the drug and uh, sexual promiscuity lifestyle that was there. And that's, this is all pre-Jesus. And he, he just was neck deep in that atmosphere. Uh, the occult, various uh, Far Eastern religions, just everything. And back then, everything was game. Everybody was searching for something. And they were dabbling in all kinds of religion and, and uh, various... Uh, philosophical arts and and uh, there was uh, in the movie if you remember the movie Lonnie said to Chuck Smith we we um, did everything in the way of drugs we did everything and we did everybody and so that was just a wild time to be alive and he was right in the middle of all that stuff he got saved while he was up there in Height Ashbury area there was a Christian coffee house called the living room. And there was a community, it was a pretty large group. And somehow people that were connected to that got the gospel to him. And, uh, he had a salvation experience. Um, exactly. Did he, did it take off and he become an evangelist? Well, somehow he was in, in the middle of that kind of atmosphere and his growth did take off where he was ready to serve God in, in any way. And he leaned toward evangelism right at the, at the beginning. After salvation, uh, he came back to Costa Mesa and he began evangelizing because that's where he was originally from. Uh, if you saw the movie Chuck Smith, uh, in the movie, Chuck Smith's daughter brings Lonnie to meet him. But in actuality, his daughter's boyfriend, who was uh, a former addict and was going to college, uh, had had an experience with Jesus, and his, and Chuck's uh, it was it was his daughter's boyfriend, soon to be husband. He would drive around the Costa Mesa area and he would pick up hitchhikers to tell them about Jesus. So one day he picks up a hitchhiker and it's Lonnie. And he and uh, he asked Lonnie, "Where are you headed?" He goes, "Well, nowhere." He goes, well, why are you hitchhiking? He said, well, I like people to pick me up so I can tell them about Jesus. So they both realized that's what they were doing. One was picking people up and talking to them. The other was hitchhiking to talk to the drivers. So uh, this guy says to Lonnie, I want to take you home and introduce you to my girlfriend's dad. He's never met one of you. So that was how they got to know one another. And Chuck saw immediately Lonnie's charisma his love for God, and his gift for evangelism. So that's how they began to come together. Now, early on, Chuck's church was very, very little, uh, like under 50 people. And Lonnie immediately started pulling these kids in off the beach, That and he just had this, this ability to be the Pied Piper and pull people along. And the church started, it was up close to 100 people, and he's bringing all of these kids in off of the beaches that he's leading to the Lord. 
and all of it very unconventional. Uh, but that was how they they got to they got together. Chuck began to see his ability to evangelize, and so he gave him the Wednesday night service. He he had the whole thing. So it would be Lonnie would arrange the music, and then these kids would come in he, who he had brought in from all over the area, usually off the beaches, and he would um, Lonnie lean toward the gifts of the Spirit, but Chuck said you got to have a sermon, so he would do a teaching. And then uh, they would just start ministering the filling of the Spirit, and uh, and the manifestations would take off. And the, the kids were coming alive because they were really coming in contact with the love of God through the, the Holy Spirit's work within them. Um, so Chuck saw the charisma and gifting on Lonnie's life. He let him minister at their Wednesday night meeting, which eventually drew thousands of people. That was the big draw, that meeting. These meetings became known for the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Slain in the Spirit, tongues, healings, words of knowledge, miracles, everything was there. Lonnie wanted to continue emphasizing the work of the Spirit, and Chuck wanted to emphasize the Bible study. And that became a dividing line between them. Chuck wanted to stick with that. Chuck had come out of four-square Pentecostal circles and had seen the abuses of the spiritual gifts. And he he felt like Lonnie was becoming more sensationalizing with that and, and bringing attention to himself and the gifting. And so that was the rift that started to develop between the two of them. During his early ministry years, Lonnie was having issues with sexual sin. So a lot of the things that happened to him as a child were beginning to manifest in a lot of promiscuity into his adulthood, and even as a, a young person who was ministering, he was still having a, a difficult time living a pure celibate life. Along that way, sometime in that period, he he met a girl, he led her to the Lord, and they eventually got married. Her name was Connie, so Lonnie and Connie began to serve together. I think the movie treated it really well, where they showed all of the communes that that they were having. And my understanding is Chuck Smith was a very good businessman, and the church was buying these homes because a lot of these kids were just hanging out all the time. So they were he wanted to put put them in homes where they could live together and do Bible studies and grow and reach out and do their evangelism. And, and they had them all over the L.A. area. Uh, at this point, Lonnie and Chuck were not on the same page. Lonnie wanted to continue the Holy Spirit meetings. Chuck wanted Bible study. The Frisbees left for a ministry in Florida. So something happened. <clears throat> in the movie, they showed it. It was like you could see the tension that was happening in Lonnie's marriage and then the the arguments that he was having with Chuck. And then the decision was made that they were going to go to Florida. So they decided to go to Florida. Now, they kept that kind of vague in the movie, but the, the ministry that they went to in Florida, and I believe it was in the Fort Lauderdale area, was Derek Smith, or sorry, Derek Prince, Don Basham, and Bob Mumford. And those three men had a ministry, and uh, it came to be known as the shepherding movement. And it was very heavy handed with uh, control. Uh, you had to, you know, whoever was your shepherd, you had to ask questions. Can I do this? Can I go there? Can I have this? And and uh, eventually, all I, I believe all those men uh, repented for, for what was happening, and, and they came out of that. But that's where Lonnie and Connie went to work on their marriage. And, and uh, so there's not a lot that's said about that shift. But in the interview, Lonnie's older brother said that those years that they were there were very hard on him because he was a sensitive, loving person that wanted to reach the lost, and this atmosphere was very structured. So <clears throat> in that time period, he, he did get divorced. I, I don't think he came back to California and then got divorced. I think uh, around late 70s, he he came back to the Costa Mesa area and he was divorced. Uh, the time in Florida wasn't healthy. They joined the shepherding movement. Okay, I talked about that. On Mother's Day in May 1979, John Wimber, who was uh, starting 
starting Bible studies, and he originally, when John Wimber got saved, he was the business manager for the Righteous Brothers. And God really touched his life, and he walked away from music, and he had several degrees in music. And uh, for six months, he had nothing. He had no job, and he, he was just leading Bible studies all over. And then some people at a Quaker church asked him to come and be on staff, so he did that. <clears throat> but he, he had connections with the things that were happening at Calvary Chapel and the young people. And uh, somehow he got connected with a church that would become a vineyard church. And he had heard Lonnie was in town. Somebody said he needs to come and give his testimony. So they, had, uh, they were renting a school they had a Sunday night service. This is Mother's Day, 79. So he invited Lonnie to come and speak. So Lonnie came, and I had heard this story about, uh, I, I heard it from uh, John Wimber's own mouth, and he was talking about that service and how he invited this young guy from, Cal- from Calvary Chapel. He didn't use his name. Uh, already, you're into a period of time where people are, are now, when they were counted, they're, they're dropping Lonnie's name. They're not talking about it because Lonnie had sexual promiscuity issues that people didn't know what to do with because he was so gifted and so anointed, even when that was taking place. So they were overlooking the sin for a time in the 70s because of the manifestations. And that's a very difficult thing. So at the end of this, I'm going to talk about that. How do you handle that? But that's what was going on with them. So it's possible that Lonnie was removed from Calvary Chapel, but Chuck Smith did it so quietly, so respect, respectively, that people didn't know that it was actually happening. Um, and that's, that's a possibility. So he ends up at, at uh, John Wimber's church, and that night he gives his testimony and he asks everybody age 25 or down. To, in fact, I, I have a quote from, from uh, a book here talking about this night. So listen to this. Uh, this is Mother's Day evening in 1979. After speaking, Frisbee invited all the young people, 25 and under, to come forward and invited the Holy Spirit to bring God's power into their lives. Witnesses say it looked like a battlefield as young people fell and began to shake and speak in tongues. The young kids, many in junior high and high school, were so filled with the Spirit that they soon started baptizing friends in hot tubs and swimming pools. Now, this is what happened afterwards, after that night. And I heard John Wimber himself said it looked like a war room. There were people laying all over. Some were shrieking. Some were laughing. Some were crying. Some were just laying there yelling in tongues. I mean... It was like whatever this anointing was, it was on Lonnie Frisbee. It was powerful and it affected people. There was no no question that the result of it was young people who loved God, loved worship, and loved Bible study and wanted to tell other people about Jesus. I mean, for me, I know for for some people, the whole signs and wonders and manifestations, that's of the devil. I don't agree with that. When you see, you go back and read what happened in Acts 2 at Pentecost, those people were filled with the Spirit, and they were getting accused of being drunk. Now, who do you accuse of being drunk? It's not a, an orderly person. And sometimes when the Spirit is pulled out, poured out, it, this crazy stuff happens. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not telling you that it's not messy, and I'm not telling you at times that there's false in there. There is. But we don't discount the whole thing. If you're leading a meeting and you want more of God and that starts to happen, you then have to begin to seek out, is this God? What's actually happening here? And John Wimber, he he went nuts. When that first happened, he was appalled at what happened. It took him days to finally catch up where God began to show him, that was me. And now the job of discipleship needs to happen. So all these young people go out and they start baptizing friends in hot tubs and swimming pools around town. The church catapulted in growth over the next few months, and the event is credited with launching the Vineyard Movement. So it was just this outpouring of the Spirit. And again, Lonnie, just, he just told his story and then asked for the Holy Spirit to come. That's, that's all he would do. And today I, I was listening 
to a sermon that was given the year after that. And Lonnie talked about in the early days at Calvary Chapel, when they were under 100 people, at the end of a service, they were all up front. There was worship music playing. They were at the altar and they're praying. And a, a prophetic word came forth that God was going to do something on the entire California coast. And it was going to be an explosion and it was going to spread across the country. Now, the Jesus People movement hadn't started in earnest across the country, but there was things happening in Southern California. So it sounds like that prophetic word is what happened over the next four or five years. And Lonnie said the prophetic word was, was that he would be at the center of this, that, he, that there would be an anointing on him and the love of God would come out of him and the miraculous. So there was something that God did that anointed him to do what he began to do. So again, I'm going to bring you back to this. Anointing and gifting doesn't mean maturity. So it's really important if you're if you are an older person in the Lord and you have somebody in your fellowship that shows great gifting, but they're immature, they have to be brought under someone's wing. Discipleship has to be happening. You can't just let wildfire start to happen because in your youth, you, you start to take credit for, for what's happening, and, and it, just, it just gets bad yeah, among the, the immature. All right, a couple other points here. It was reported that Lonnie's sexual indiscretions were known by many in the ministry circles. It also had been reported that John Wimber confronted him about the allegations, and Lonnie admitted to them. They parted ways then, uh, somewhere around 1980, 81. That came to an end. Now, I don't have a lot of information. What did Lonnie do? And he kind of drifted, but he did some preaching around the world and he had a following. But there were these, uh, there was a period in the mid 80s where there was just a, a lot of sin that was taking place. And uh, Lonnie ended up dying of AIDS on March 12, 1993. So we, we don't want to forget his contribution to the kingdom of God, to evangelism, and to that outpouring, that, that period, there was a gifting that was on him. So let me, let's make a couple of comments along here. Lonnie Frisbee seems to be the classic case where the gifting overshadows the maturity. This is always a struggle for those leading when an outpouring comes. What do you allow and what do you restrict and this is difficult, you know, and there are those who are very uncomfortable with anything to do with the Holy Spirit, so they just write the whole thing off and say that this isn't for today. There's no openness to the Spirit moving. And, you, you know, nowadays, because, because this guy has put so many of his opinions out there, Dr. John MacArthur is one of those that is a strong cessationist, so he's a voice for not believing any of this as being legitimate. And in fact, the other day he was interviewed and he was asked about Asbury and, and he made this disparaging remark about the revival saying it was designed around this National Collegiate Day of Prayer. Well, I, I completely disagree and I would hope that, that a statement like that would be made because you talk to somebody at the college to, to actually check that out. And I bring him up because he, he's, he's out there and, and his comments are out there. And I just don't agree with his view, uh, especially his, his view of certain spiritual gifts being not for today and, and that kind of thing. Um, when the Spirit is poured out, we shouldn't make a judgment from 3,000 miles away. That was one of the reasons why I was glad that I took the ride to Wilmore, Kentucky to experience a little bit of what was taking place there. We need to go to see what was happening. You know, a couple of weeks ago when I when I talked about Asbury, what I, I didn't tell you was in 2019, we heard about an outpouring that was at a church, uh, Christ Church in Dawsonville, Georgia. Now it's referred to as the North Georgia Revival. And uh, because I always tend to drag my feet with that stuff and Connie wants to go, this time she saw it, and I said, okay. So she saw that it was happening on Wednesday and Friday morning. We were headed for Dawsonville. And that was a, a, a move of the Spirit that's still going on that came through water baptism. And the pastor had a vision 
Uh, he was at the point of resigning his church, uh, Pastor Todd Smith, and he was on the platform during the week when nobody was in there, and, and the church, the, the auditorium, I don't know, it seats six, 700 people maybe, <clears throat> and they had about 200 people in there. And he was walking back and forth on the platform, and he looked at the baptistry, and he had an open vision. The baptistry was full of water, and there was a strip of flame going down through it. And the Lord told him, if you'll baptize him in water, I'll baptize him in fire. And so just out of obedience on a Sunday night, he told everybody what the Lord told him. And he didn't care if they'd been believer baptism or not. This was different baptism. And what happened was the church had been through a lot of trouble and people started confessing sin and repenting and inner healing was taking place and deliverance. It was an incredible move. Then people started coming. People started coming from all over the country because they heard about this. And they would baptize people on a Sunday night till five in the morning. And, and to their credit, they, they decided not to do it every day because it burns people out. So they stuck with Sunday night and uh, it's still going on. And it was an incredible thing. So when you're in the middle of something, you need to be there. And, and if, you're, if, if you're in charge, if you're in a, a position of authority, you've got to sort this through looking to your heavenly father. Tell me what's happening. Lead me. You know, you, we have to be led by the Spirit, and it does stretch us with some of those things that we do see. Okay, let me get back to making a couple of these comments because I want to I want to wrap this up. Some would say that Chuck Smith hindered the work of the Spirit, yet evangelism and maturity in the Word continued long after Frisbee was gone. I mean, within 10 years, Calvary Chapel was 25,000 people. And by saying this, I'm not diminishing what Lonnie accomplished. Lonnie was an evangelist, and the power of the Spirit, the baptisms of the Spirit that were taking place, it was incredible, those events. But his behavior meant that something had to happen. It had to be dealt with. They could no longer ignore his private behavior because of the gifting and the anointing. And this is one of the things that happens with churches until finally the scandal hits the, hits the internet. And, and people are asking, why didn't you deal with this? Because the leader was so gifted and it was so advantageous for the church to lead them in a position that they're in because the crowds are coming and they're getting results. You start making decisions based on result, not on purity and righteousness. That's where it starts to go sideways. And it sounds like they dealt with things properly in Lonnie's case. Now, there are those people that are diehard vineyard people, and they want to defend Lonnie. They want, it should never have stopped. They should have left him in that position. You cannot do that. When sin is at work in the camp, you have to deal with it. And this was a stronghold. Now, having done inner healing and deliverance now for so many years, there are people that have been molested and raped in childhood, and it miswires them. There, there is such a struggle. They have a heart for God, but they're dealing with a lot inside of them. It takes patience, applying the word, reassuring, keeping them in the love of God for those who have a heart that's broken and contrite, and they want more of God overcoming the sexual urges is one of the, if it's probably the greatest uh, transformation that has to happen with a person. And I've seen it happen. I've seen good things happen. But if you're going to disciple that person and you're going to minister to them, you're going to have to be patient as these things are being reworked on the inside of them. From a distance, it looks to me like things were handled very well. <clears throat> I've heard in some... Uh, I've heard some uh, in interviews or teaching downplay the sin Lonnie was committing because in their thinking, the vessel of the move of the Spirit should not be interfered with. I think this is ill-advised. Leadership must be held to a higher standard of conduct. In fact, 1 Timothy 5.20 says this, Elders who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. So when where leadership goes, the rest of the people will eventually follow. It has to be kept righteous and in, in accordance with God's word. If Lonnie was disciplined because of his sexual sin, it must have been very difficult for those leaders around him to make those decisions, knowing how many it would affect. If you're Chuck Smith and you're seeing what he's doing and you have a passion 
to, to disciple and to see young people come to Christ, it's difficult for you to make that call. It was probably very difficult for John Wimber to make the call. He didn't want, they were giving him time to, to get things together, but it couldn't, it could, it wasn't happening. Church history is full of tragic stories of leaders who were looked at as being above confrontation because they were so gifted. Eventually, their personal kingdom comes crashing to the ground. It's going to catch up. It has to be dealt with. When there's a move of the Spirit, the early days are full of fresh excitement. There's a lot of powerful Holy Spirit activity that's thrilling, but eventually the task of discipleship has to begin. And that's those are the difficult times. You know, you look at what, what took place at Asbury. Eventually, school has to go on. Now they they never canceled classes, but they were the school was criticized because they they stopped allowing the public to come in. But there was there was so much that was happening that poor little town couldn't handle. It. There weren't enough parking lots. There weren't enough roads. It was they were being overrun. So at some point, the goal is not meetings. Okay, now this is a, this is a perfect this is a personal view. When the Spirit is poured out, the goal is not meetings because there will always be somebody that says, let's keep the meetings going. Even though even though the anointing may be dropping off, we have to do the meetings. There will always be somebody that will do that. I guarantee you there's still people that are out there on the lawn at Asbury. The goal of the outpouring is that we would be his witnesses. The goal is that we would live a holy life. The goal is not to pull up in that spot and not leave. Think about the night of uh, uh, transfiguration when Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on the mount and they see Elijah, Moses, and Jesus in their glory. Peter wants to build a booth, a tabernacle for the three of them. Jesus doesn't even respond to what he says. Because this is, we want to, when we have an incredible, powerful encounter with God, we want to build a memorial right there. We just want to stay put. This is holy ground. Let's keep coming. Let's stay here. That's not why it happened. It happened to fill you so that wherever you go, you take it with you. And then you go back to whatever your calling is, whatever your gifting is, whatever your area of building the kingdom is. You now have gotten this charge of love for God, a love for righteousness, a desire to obey. You're, you're ready. You're energized. You're, you've got the power of the Spirit. Now you've, you, you understand what the motive is to do this. Now you can go back and do what you've been called to do with new life, new vibrancy. That's what it's for. And it isn't just a one-time thing. We should be always asking for more of the Holy Spirit to give us that power and that, the juice to keep serving God the motive to keep doing this. It isn't so that we'll pull up and just have meetings. Those are fun. They're energizing. They're fun when they come, but eventually we've got to go back and serve. Now, I'm saying that that has to be done in leadership as the Spirit of God leads you. This is tricky. It's not easy. It's not easy to be. I've never been in the middle of something like that where I had to make that kind of decision. But from what I can see from a distance, the leadership at Asbury treated this with respect and reverence to try to figure out what is it that God wanted to accomplish in that moment. <clears throat> Unless we're in the middle of it, we don't know what we do. God gives wisdom for the moment. Until the Jesus Revolution movie came out, Lonnie Frisbee was relatively unknown. He's there in the history books, but very few people spoke of him. We need to tell the story, and we need to tell the entire story with respect and sensitivity. Experiencing sexual abuse as a child left him deeply wounded. Back in his day, no one, no one knew what to do with that. Nobody knew what to do for him. <clears throat> Thank God there's help for the wounded today. So many men live in private pools of shame and don't know where to turn. I've had great admiration for what he accomplished, that's Lonnie, in the kingdom of God. So many heard and believed the gospel because of the signs and wonders he operated in. Thank you, Lord, for the life of Lonnie Frisbee. Let's remember what he did and then remember the difficulty. Sometimes when God moves, it gets messy. So us, you and I that are leaders, you know, 
We want revival. We want an outpouring of the Spirit. Let's just go into it with humility, remembering when it actually comes sometimes. There's very difficult decisions that have to be made. But we need the outpouring to fill us with new life and love for God and His Word. So, Father, move among your people. Fill us with your Spirit. Give us the outpourings, Lord. Give us more. We're seeing these things that are happening among students. Let it spread to your people. Lord, I ask that that it, it happened with men, that you would bring an outpouring on men, fill them with the Spirit, bring healing to the deep wounds that they have, uh, drench them in your love, and give them a hunger and a thirst for righteousness and to know your word. Lord, we need you to move. We need you. We are a desperate people. We need you to move, Lord. We look to you and we trust you. We thank you for the outpourings that we do see in Jesus' name. Amen.